Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, my name is Lisa Ranahan Anthorn. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the Micronesia Conservation Trust. Um, and I'm happy to be presenting to you today. Um, the Micronesia Conservation Trust here is our mission and vision statements. Um, our vision is enduring partnerships that can serve our land and sea to improve the quality of life for communities across Micronesia. And in order to do this, we build partnerships, raise and manage funds, make grants, influence policy, and provide conservation and financing expertise. We work in the Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Republic of Palau, the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas, and the U.S. Territory of Guam. Our board is currently um, updating our strategic action plan, and there will be some minor changes to our vision and mission statements, but our work will re remain basically the same going forward. Um, we kind of work in the middle between external and uh, national and regional entities, bringing in um, international funding. Um, you know, the ideas of thought leaders and conservation experts um, and international policy, we bring that into MCT and we disperse that knowledge and that funding to our local partners and um, to projects, community leaders and Micronesian governments. And then similarly, we take the results of, you know, of, the, of the work that they do and their thinking and um, what works on the ground here and funnel it back out to the, to the wider world. Um, we, try to maintain, take at least 80% you know, of the funding that we bring in is regranted or goes directly to work on the ground. Um, we try to keep our admin costs down as much as we can. Um, and we connect Micronesia to the broader conservation community. Um, so that's kind of the way we operate general thinking. Um, we were incorporated in 2002 in the Federated States of Micronesia as a charitable irrevocable co corporation. Uh, like I said, we serve all of the jurisdictions of the Northern Micronesia, American affiliated uh, countries and territories. Um, our governing board is, uh, consists of seven regional trustees, three international trustees, one, um, one based in Japan, one based in the United States and one based in Europe. Um, and we have an ex officio donor uh, representative. We maintain 501c3 tax exempt status at, in the United States. Um, currently we have an endowment of roughly $27 million. The people that we serve include Micronesian conservation organizations, local governments, local communities and technical partners. Um, and we maintain cred accreditations with the adaptation fund and the Green Climate Fund. <clears throat> um, so in terms of the kinds of funds that we manage, we, like I said, have a, a, the Micronesia Challenge Endowment at $27 million. Um, we have an operational endowment um, at about, oh, I'm sorry, I reversed those. The operational endowment is, one, is at about, about $1 million. And then the Yella Conservation Easement Endowment is at about $810,000. The Yella Conservation Easement is um, protecting a forest of ka trees in Koshai. It's the only place on earth where there's an existing um, viable stand of ka trees. So um, this is, uh, a conservation easement protecting that area. We also manage uh, several advised thinking funds from multiple donors, which include uh, primarily US-based foundations, US federal agencies, and then multilateral facilities like the Adaptation Fund and the Green Climate Fund. Um, so those, the, the, those funds average about $2.5 million a year, but we're expecting a big jump uh, next year because of a, a new uh, green Climate Fund project. Um, the regranting over the years, we've supported and are supporting over 150 sites across Micronesia. We also um, do capacity building and network coordination. Um, two of the networks that we uh, coordinate are the Micronesians and Island Conservation and the Pacific Islands Managed and Protected Areas Community. We also um, have several scholarship programs, internship programs, and a legal fellows program. Um, and then we also have a, a new sustainable livelihoods program 
the two major projects there are Coconuts for Life and a Women's Solar Engineers project um, in the state of Chuuk. And then uh, we are starting a Green Climate Fund um, SAP project around uh, climate smart agriculture pro projects. Um, so in terms of our experience with accreditation, we are accredited to the Adaptation Fund and to the Green Climate Fund. Um, for the Adaptation Fund, we sub submitted our initial application in April of 2012. Um, it took two years of uh, revisions and improvements to our organizational policies and back and forth with the, um, the, the fund's accreditation panel. Um, and in 2014, they were satisfied with our application. Um, some of the work that we had to do included um, our strengthening our uh, procurement procedures, um, developing an anti-fraud policy and whistleblower policy. Some comments that we got from the accreditation committee, um, there were a lot of concerns about our, the level of regranting in our grant management um, experience. They wanted, documentation of grants that we made to Micronesian partners in like in the one to two, three million dollar range. And the biggest grants that we'd made at that time were, you know, averaging, you know, 30 to 50,000. And we had like one $100,000 grant that we'd made. And so we weren't at the kind of uh, funding level that they were expecting to be able to um, assess. Um, and then we, they, you know, we had to demonstrate that we had the capacity to manage the adaptation fund, uh, the funding. We had to improve our monitoring and evaluation and the quality at entry. They wanted stronger oversight from our board of trustees. And then there was a, a long running conversation about internal audit. When we applied, we had a staff of, I think, 13, no, not even 10 people. And we just couldn't we didn't need and couldn't maintain an internal audit function. Um, so there was a lot of back and forth about these kinds of things, which eventually resulted in the board approving a streamlined accreditation process, you know, de designed specifically for small uh, NIEs. Um, and so that process was approved by the board in October, 2014. And we were finally accredited in March of 2015 with some conditions, um, you know, that they, we weren't, uh, we were limited in the amount of money that we could, uh, the size of project that we could request at to $1 million. Um, and then we had to specify procurement procedures for each project um, that we, you know, submitted app, uh, proposals for. Um, and then again, the, the stronger oversight by the board committee on investment audit and finance. Um, and so that uh, stronger oversight kind of satisfied their um, concerns over internal audit for the for the you know for the beginning of the of our role as NIE. Um, we were reaccredited um, in June of this year um, and then in, during in 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 getting reaccredited they did increase our limit um, to dollars thousand dollar project or approved in 2017, um, and we managed that well with our performance in 21, they increased our lending. Um, for the Green Climate Fund, we were um, uh, finally, we were accredited in 2017. Um, because organizations are accredited to the Adaptation Fund, GEF, Europe, Europe Aid and the European Commission are eligible for fast track accreditation. So they only would look at the uh, requirements that were outside the scope of the, of the first accreditation. Um, in 2016, uh, the Green Climate Fund was offering free um, assistance from PricewaterhouseCooper for, to, to perform gap assessments for accreditation. So we took advantage of that opportunity and we conducted the gap assessment um, as if we were applying for regular accreditation, not the fast track. Um, so we wanted them to look at everything. Um, and we considered that assessment as an opportunity to gauge our improvements since the adaptation fund accreditation process. Um, we did eventually go with a fast track process, but we went through the, we went through the assessment as if we were 
trying to get accredited through regular channels. Um, so the, uh, the, 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 assess, the gap assessment again called out the internal audit issue. Um, you know, they wanted to see updated TORs for the board committees and employees tweaks to financial management, um, uh, more uh, procedures around anti-terrorism, money laundering, fraud, um, and uh, risk and uh, environment and social risk mitigation, gender policy, communications, and monitoring and evaluation. The ones with the green check marks are things that we went ahead and addressed um, uh, based on the gap assessment. Um, because the Green Climate Fund had really prioritized specific island countries for uh, uh, direct access entities accreditation, um, we went ahead and took advantage of the fast track process um, because the, the, the secretariat really encouraged us to do so. They wanted to have small island uh, direct access entities accredited as soon as possible. So, um, you know, it was relatively fast after, the, after we did the gap assessment. Um, so we were accredited in 2017 for micro level grants with a, the social risk category of C and the f basic fiduciary uh, standards, project management and grant awards. So we're also accredited to re-grant funding from the, grant, the GCF. We did our midterm accreditation review this year um, and we continue to meet all of the relevant accreditation standards um, and so uh, the secretary will be recommending to the board next month um, that we remain accredited. Um, what we learned from the process is, um, and kind of our approach to it was that we undertook the both accreditation processes um, as an exercise in building our own capacity for its own sake in the interest of improving our organization in order to better serve our stakeholders. So our kind of thinking was that, you know, regardless of whether we get accredited or not, we'll, take, you, we'll use this process and all of the external, you know, assessments and uh, questions and review processes as a way to make our organization better, just to get better. It was an opportunity to reevaluate our performance, our policies, and so on and so forth, um, uh, just for its own sake, so that we could serve our stakeholders better. Um, we were extremely persistent. <laughs> we, um, you know, we get we'd get really tough questions, and we'd had a lot of naysayers, and we, you know, did our best to answer questions, and then we, but you know, we had to push back. Um, Sometimes too, and just repeatedly tell the adaptation fund or the Green Climate Fund, hey, we don't have examples of 100 you know million dollar projects that we've you know made to local stakeholders. You know we can't give you that, um, but here's you know here's what we do have. And so there was a lot of back and forth, uh, and around the audit, internal audit issues, things like that. Um, and we never ever asked, you know, hesitated to ask for help or to accept help when it was offered. And you know, and some what may have seemed like unlikely sources, um, you know, so we had to think creatively and see where we could find, you know, help and assistance and support endorsements and so on. Um, and again, push back and challenge when necessary. And then also be very aware of and leverage the fund's stated priorities. Like I said, with the adaptation fund, they had just, you know, started a big push to accredit small entities, small direct access entities. And so, you know, we kind of jumped on that and leveraged it, you know, and, and you know, we felt like we could push back because we knew that they really wanted us to be accredited at the end of the day. And so, um, and with the, the, the Green Climate Fund, the uh, ambassador from Samoa had just stepped down as co-chair and the, you know, at, uh, at the board meeting in Samoa, they announced a, you know, a, a focus on accrediting Pacific Island entities. And so we kind of, you know, we, were, we knew about that and we had a lot of support in the secretariat based on that and took advantage of that, um, you know, when we were going through the accreditation process. Um, what might have we done differently? Um, we probably would have sought assistance from fund specific experts early in the process. We did get help from experts early in the process, but not ones that were specifically um, experts in the adaptation fund uh, accreditation requirements or the GCF accreditation requirements. Um, we had help from TNC, you know, 
TNC financial management procurement experts and, you know, in kind of general expertise around um, accreditation processes and management issues and things like that, um, financial management and budgeting, um, but not ones that were specific to specifically knowledgeable about the funds that we were, you know, asking to be accredited to. Um, oh, it's not clear. So in terms of what might be the, um, you know, advantages, benefits of accreditation, you know, there's, we, you know, obviously are able to bring in increased funding for climate change adaptation work and projects. Um, and then just having, you know, that little check mark by accredited to adaptation fund, green climate fund, and also the 501c3 status in the US, it improves um, donor confidence. Donors are, you know, more, you know, sure that we are able to manage any funding that they send our way. Um, it also has heightened visibility of and, and awareness of our work, um, uh, partly because, you know, we were, you know, the first really small accredited entity to the adaptation fund. We were one of the first um, accredited in the Pacific. So being the first was part of that, but just in general, being accredited to these um, entities, you know, raises your profile. Um, and then, um, and it's also strengthened our governance and operational capacity. Um, drawbacks might include the increased internal organizational formality that's required. You know, we, have a small staff. We started very, very small and informal and you know, felt like we were nimble and flexible. And um, so the, you know, the increased organization of uh, formality required is sometimes uncomfortable for us. Um, there's increased monitoring and reporting burdens, both for MCT and, um, and then we also then end up having to pass some of that onto our grantees. Um, and they don't always have the capacity to, um, to do that, which then increases our workload, helping them through these requirements. Um, so it's uh, it's kind of an, a, a vicious circle there, um, and we're working to deal with it. Um, and it you know, and the uh, just the costs and time and effort to maintain the accreditations and the um, manage the an, uh, added requirements. Um, and then for the actually the core topic of. <laughs> of this session, I think, is you know, the relevance of the practice standards for the CTFs. Um, this document wasn't available, actually, when we first began our accreditation uh, journey, um, and, but it really would have been useful if it had been available, um, because you know, the standards that are in the document are really in line with adaptation fund and GCF requirements for policies and documentation. And you know the the policies and types of documents and evidence um, in support of procedures that were requested by the adaptation fund the GCF are included in the standards. So if you have all of these things in place, you know going through the accreditation process would most likely just require you know, like small tweaks in you know what you have existing because the standards are you know very much in line with you know what's expected of organizational management. Um, and I think that's the end of my presentation. So I'll say kalangan, which is thank you here on Ponte. Um, and, um, oh, I'm sorry, the email address is incorrect. I'm Lisa Ranahan Andon, um, and it's deputy at ourmicronesia.org um, rather than adaptation. And um, those are our social media connections. Thank you very much. <laughs>